It gives me great pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, and I want to thank uh, the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy uh, for hosting such a, a prestigious conference. Um, I think the Institute has the, uh, the right idea of bringing together diplomats, scholars, students, um, and practitioners, other types of practitioners. Um, after all, when it's uh, said and done, the best diplomacy is one that occurs uh, that gets people to talk to each other, despite what their governments might uh, want to do, um, whether the governments are on board or not. But I particularly want to thank Mark um, for his keen organizational skills and outstanding commitment to cultural diplomacy. Uh, when he did, uh, when I was approached to um, prepare a talk for the, um, the conference, I agreed to do so without hesitation. Not only am I in awe of what the uh, Institute is doing when I peruse the website and I, I get word from different places, uh, but I also um, always look for the opportunity to add my two cents to uh, the dialogue on cultural diplomacy. Um, I teach, as you know, and um, I have this captive audience of students, um, many of them who take the courses simply because their um, their requirements. Um, but as rich as those dialogues might be, it's never quite the same when you get people who willingly come um, to have a, uh, a conversation with you. So I'm, I'm very appreciative um, that we can have this um, dialogue uh, and ponder some specific questions. And for me, um, the key question is, what are the best tools for maximizing cultural diplomacy in a rapidly changing world? Um, and so my title, Cultural Diplomacy Begins at Home, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. um, cultural diplomacy begins at home, it might seem like a really odd uh, topic given that we normally think of uh, cultural diplomacy as an act that one carries out with communities abroad. Uh, of course, this is true, um, but uh, in a very generic definition of cultural diplomacy that we can all agree on, uh, it's an activity that opens the pathway um, to continued dialogue uh, because it demonstrates the best that our society has to offer and it inspires others to achieve their best as well. Um, Yet in order for the diplomacy to work well, it is a good idea to think of the preparation that goes behind the making of that endeavor uh, and not just the end product or what you aspire for it to be, but rather how you get to the nitty gritty level of um, making the diplomacy. Um, in addition, or um, as a part of that, anticipating how the diplomatic e efforts might be received abroad is a key to the success. And it is this last strategy that I wish to address, um, which is anticipation of how you'll be received. Uh, and while I am speaking largely of the United States and its efforts in cultural diplomacy, my comments actually might apply in general to most other nations. Um, this is not without careful thought uh, because it is a little controversy, uh, controversial normally when people talk about cultural diplomacy, they just talk about the good stuff um, and they don't talk about uh, some of the failures, some of the nasty stuff, some of the stuff uh, that doesn't work well. Uh, but there are times, frankly, um, that we need to do that because sometimes there, there is a disconnect um, between what we say and how others perceive what we do. Uh, I think of some of these instances when our country's deeds are held up to suspicion and scrutiny, particularly in the developing world. Um, as the State Department put it, so um, I'm not just out there on a limb, it's actually um, our own State Department that recognizes some issues. Um, America is viewed in much of the world less as a beacon of hope than as a dangerous force to be countered. This view diminishes our ability to champion freedom, democracy, and individual dignity. Ideas that continue to fuel hope for oppressed peoples everywhere. The erosion of our trust and cre credibility within the international community must be reversed if we hope to use more than our military and economic might in the shaping of the world opinion. Culture matters. 
This is from our State Department, so it's not just me. Um, but let me confess, though, some very selfish reasons for wanting to tackle this issue of perception. Like any prof uh, professional who travels abroad, I interact with colleagues who are similar to me in other ways, many ways. For a long time, these have been professors in various disciplines. Increasingly, they are also academic administrators as well. In my particular case, my counterparts are typically colleagues of the Global South. But the same can be true in whatever region that colleagues happen to claim as home. These counterparts see me as a representative of my country, often of the government and often to my chagrin. Um, no matter how I protest and declare otherwise, they, want to, they ask me, you know, why do you people do this or how can you change this? And I say, I'm not speaking for the government, but that's not what they, uh, that's not what they believe. Uh, therefore, when we come together for conferences or other activities related to what we do in academia, the subject inevitably turns to implementation and long-term effectiveness of our efforts. Often, it is possible for me to point out specific successes of what happens in the United States and hold the, up these gains as a model. However, there are times when U.S. performance, shall we say, is less than stellar and my colleagues abroad demand answers from me. In this sense, the level of engagement with my colleagues abroad can be alternately fruitful and frustrating. Um, as you are noting, my focus here is not on the big idea of international policy making. It's not the systems level of analysis, but rather some of the smaller, more obscure details of particular problems that might fit into one theory or another. Um, not every dialogue should be about grand theory, particularly when it comes to practical matters like implementation, small pieces of the big idea need addressing. Uh, and so I am looking at ways to grapple with some lingering issues that, if made better, can enhance the hard work of cultural diplomacy. These are the issues that stump me personally. They stump me the most. Uh, the political partisanship in our country, uh, a continuing racial divide the, despite the fact that uh, it is true as um, the Cultural um, Institute um, states and many people state, um, you know, there's a, a great diversity in this country and the U.S. does um, embrace um, many, many different cultures and peoples. Well, despite that, there is a continuing divide and we it doesn't hurt to talk about that. I think it does a, a great deal of do, uh, good. Um, and also, um, I'm stumped by gun violence here in the country. Surely you have your own list of what bugs you about your country and its uh, projection abroad, whether you are from the U.S. or whether you are a citizen of any other country in the world. But these are my concerns that I struggle with intellectually, but also at a gut level. Um, with regard to partisanship, Members of the United States Congress may not come to physical blows, as we see in various countries around the world, yet how much should we feel comfortable with telling other nations about how to put aside differences, both petty and large, and work towards the greater good? As I research and dialogue about good governance in developing countries, I am often saddened by issues that impede a country or a region's progress. This particular issue is more strident in sub-Saharan Africa than it is in the countries of Latin America, the two regions, as Mark uh, alluded to, that are the center of my teaching and research. In the second data, a decade of the 21st century, the ethnic divisions brought about by the end of the 19th century scramble for Africa and that continued after independence, mostly in 1960. Um, this um, ethnic division persists in, uh, in being a major obstacle to progress in too many countries. Dominant political parties are too often dominant ethnic groups, unwilling to yield even a tiny fraction of control to smaller ethnic groups whom they disdain. Now whether this ethnic strife is a true factor or whether it is merely the excuse 
that an individual or a party gives in order to strip the country of its rich natural resources, keeping advantages for themselves, it is painful to us all to see this well into the 21st century. A major problem for me, though, remains the difficulty of offering models of excellence once I point out the specific problem um, uh, I am dealing with in that country. Lately, the actions of our Congress make it difficult for me to suggest ways that another country's legislator can get its act together. Um, on the one hand, it is, gr it is great to highlight what the U.S. does well. After all, such actions bear repeating. Um, at the same time, we should prepare ourselves for criticism in areas where we are lacking. Would anyone here suggest to a country's legislature that has trouble getting beyond its partisan divides, would anyone suggest that we hold up the U.S. Congress as a beacon of success on the road to democracy? Uh, I, th I hope not. Um, while the debates rarely end in fisticuffs, as they do in the le legislative chambers of some countries, the inaction and sometimes deliberate sabotaging of the opposite party's efforts are cause for ridicule around the world. And feedback from colleagues, that is the question of race. Um, uh, uh, not race itself, but racial divide, I should say. Long ago, Communist countries learned how to ridicule the United States because of its racial segregation. In fact, Cuba incorporated uh, into its fictional movies footage of violent reactions to civil rights movements. We now know of the deep divides, including racial strife within many countries, uh, including former and present communist, regime, communist regimes. Yet th that does not alter the fact that the world continues to watch, including where it concerns African Americans, descendants of slaves in this country, uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, the violence uh, and death of uh, Trayvon Martin, and other more recent racial encounters make the news in all corners of the globe. Racial disharmony has never been the sole province of black and white in this country, but this is the pattern that I have to deal with when I travel to both Latin America and Africa. For example, I am currently researching ruling 168.13 um, from the Dominican Republic, and um, in, a, in a broad way, you're probably all familiar with that. Um, this ruling is, um, is stripping three generations of Dominicans of Haitian descent um, of their Dominican citizenship. Uh, even though they are Dominican, um, it's a ruling that goes back um, uh, several decades uh, and it is stripping them of their citizenship. With all the vile machinations that I'm uncovering, what can I say to my Dominican colleagues about the nexus of immigration policies and race? Especially consider considering where the United States is right now on the issue of immigration. I read with disdain the recent attacks against the Jewish population in France, attacks that are no longer the province of ultra-right um, groups in that country. Yet, my counterparts point to many instances in this country that are equally depraved. It is true that the United States does a much better job of embracing diversity than other countries, yet we can and should do better. Um, with respect to gun violence, um, and again, this is my, my own nitpicking. Um, they're small issues for some, but they loom large for me. President Obama recently remarked that gun violence is becoming a weekly occurrence in this country. Um, and it is such a, a truth that one comes to expect it and perhaps become immune to it, as long as it does not touch one's immediate family or friends. When I look at the majority of democratic countries, few have the legacy of citizen violence in which victims, often unknown to the assailant, are gunned down in innocent acts of simply going about their business. School children, cinema goers, and others with no hidden agenda or argument with the assailant lose their lives. The most vociferous response has become the least likely to quell the increase in killings. Stronger gun lobbying efforts that result in the sale of more weapons, including assault weapons, 
uh, to individuals. What lesson in cultural diplomacy is this teaching? U.S. gun violence is not a part of the dialogue that we share when advocating a better way to go about a safe and prosperous society. However, governments of other countries and their citizens are keenly aware of this failing of ours. Um, just not to be uh, completely negative, and uh, I'm actually not, believe it or not. Uh, I'm not so negative on, on this country. Um, I do believe that we do um, there are a number of things that we perform better than other countries, um, but that's not enough. Um, but I, I would like, most of what the United States proffers to the world continues to be solid, often stellar examples of how a nation progresses in such a complex world. Still, when it comes to specific problems, we must also admit to our shortcomings, including when we are dealing with other nations and international entities. It is no longer enough to state, we may not be perfect, but we, what we do is better than what you do. Um, that is simply a veiled smug way of saying, do as I say, not as I do. In his timely book, Richard Haas alludes to this when he states that restoration would put the country back in a position to lead by example. And he later follows up by declaring that our failures at home are placing at risk the continued ability of the United States to exert the global influence that it, uh, that it could and should have. Uh, and I, this is from his most recent book. Um, somehow the title uh, is similar to mine, uh, Foreign Policy Begins at Home. Um, he did it first. Um, it is no longer enough to say, do as I say, not as I do or to say that despite our shortcomings, we are a mighty country. As Moises Naim um, says, uh, he shows us in his book, The End of Power, the international climate has changed to the point where it ceases to be true that groups, including less powerful countries, less powerful ethnic or um, other groups within those countries, are willing to accept without questioning the law as it is handed down by the powers that be. We need only to look at the push from the global south to see one manifestation of this, and this is actually, those are actually my words. Um, instead of do as I say, not as I do, the United States can strive more to make sure that key components of its agenda match the rhetoric of its cultural diplomacy. As the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy, for cultural diplomacy knows so well, education is the key to combating these ills of society. In all aspects of cultural diplomacy, there is room for improvement. There is much to be done. There are several options to ensure successful and long-term relationships with our counterparts around the globe. Some areas uh, require bold new actions, while others demand a refining of existing practices. As a professor who dabbles in administration, I recommend courses that are both able to adapt to the moment's needs, while at the same time ensure that every curriculum is steeped in core principles of learning that will carry the students through a lifetime. In addition, more level of uh, skill level courses, even at the undergraduate level, can prepare them for the world they are facing. For example, conflict resolution need not be solely a course that trains students how to better help groups over there. Instead, it might be prudent to include in that same course materials that grapple with the gang violence in this country, the racial discord, and even the legislative failings of our own partisan divide. Um, I, I would see more joint degree programs um, more study abroad for uh, undergrads, um, where it should be um, a yeah, much higher percentage of um, students studying abroad. I mean, it's um, all of you can think about your very first experience abroad and the shock. Mine happened to be to Colombia, uh, and it was when Juan Valdez, the image of Colombia was uh, that of Juan Valdez uh, selling his coffee, brewing his coffee. Um, it was much uh, before, long before the drug wars, um, but that experience as an undergraduate, the first time out of the country, it opened my 
my, um, my mind to um, ideas that I had never thought before. Uh, my world expanded uh, greatly, and uh, in my uh, opinion, study abroad should actually, it should be as mandatory as any other requirements that a university has. Now how it happens, because it is expensive and whatever, that's another story. Um, I would also argue that uh, more bold partnerships along the lines of what some institutions um, are doing. Uh, Michigan State, for example, um, has do is doing some wonderful things um, around the world. They're actually um, going in the country and um, there are true partnerships that are taking place. Um, where it's not a question of Michigan State going in saying, okay, we are here to do this for you. It's actually um, helping countries to do that for themselves. Um, and I think more of that should take place. Um, it's probably, um, well, in the developing world, um, I would investigate more fully the concept of a virtual university um, that effort of the World Bank that was carried out, for example, in Uganda, um, it had, you know, um, mixed success, shall we say it that way, diplomatically. Um, but um, the fact that it is not hugely successful does not mean that the effort should end completely. Um, instead, I would uh, argue that we should build on that um, it, uh, so that eventually a meaningful, well-respected education is in the hands of members of a younger generation of people who, despite their abject poverty, often know how to maximize usage of the technology. Um, you know, the young people, people younger than me, they know how to use uh, their cell phone for so much more than I do. I just make the call. And in fact, I told, uh, you know, I tell people often, you know, my cell phone is just for emergencies. So, you know, don't call me, don't call me, don't text me, don't do whatever. But these young people, I mean, they're doing so much more with it. And these are not necessarily well-educated folks. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of hope there. Um, for businesses, um, as part of this dialogue on cultural diplomacy, um, I would, um, I think they should bite the bullet and make the ultimate investment uh, by continually educating their employees, particularly those who will be around in the foreseeable future, uh, making learning um, something new and, uh, and cool for the young people in the workplace. Um, from where I sit, the above recommendations can go a long way in maximizing cultural diplomacy uh, in addition to the above concrete proposals, it is good to remember that one can never underestimate the need to establish context when conducting research on any global, indeed regional, endeavor. In this manner, what looks like democracy in some regions of the world, for example, uh, inevitably differs from what we in the United States declare as the same. Um, now, a major component of this conference uh, this week is building cultural bridges. One of the best ways to do so is to curry respect for your actions by syncing how you see yourself and how others see you. Uh, so as we gather here at the conference uh, over this three-day period, two, two and a half, three-day period, uh, and return to our respective institutions and workplaces, let us be mindful of the work we must continue to do, even if we think that we do diplomacy better than any other country. Um, those are my short remarks, and hopefully, um, you know, we can carry on more of a dialogue, because this is what this is all about. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaplan, for an excellent presentation, which I'm sure has inspired comments and, uh, and responses. I agree with, I think, all of the points, especially the point you were making regarding academic exchange. What's great about academic exchange, for me, it's almost the perfect model of culture diplomacy because it's about facilitating access, mm -hmm. not actually controlling what happens with the access. Right. And that, I would argue, is one of the main challenges that the world faces today. The main difference between human beings isn't actually race or ethnicity or country or nationality or religion, it's access. 
Some people in the world have access to what they want and what they need, some don't. And I think that's really where ad academic exchange is exactly responding. Uh, come here, study, make friends, make enemies, make up your own mind, go home. Uh, and that kind of honest exchange really, I think, can lay a foundation for trust and understanding. Uh, but I want to give you all a chance to, to respond with questions or comments to Ms. Captain. Okay, and as always, if you could briefly introduce yourself as well. Yeah, I had a question before, as I told you, I used to teach German at the Naval Academy, but now I'm working for the Goethe Institute, which ah. is a German cultural institute, and at the same time, in interestingly enough, for the Confucius Institute, which is the Chinese cultural institute. And I'm actually chaperone for the high school students who go to China. Ah. And I was so happy when you mentioned the importance of going abroad. And so this specific program that we are doing is not organized by us in the States, but it's organized by the Chinese. Mm. And I just wanted to mention how successful these programs are. And we call it summer bridge programs. So they actually build bridges between the high schoolers in America and the Chinese. Mm. And I happen to have my two own children with me on some of these trips, and I've, many of their friends had never left the country. And after they right. came back from China, I've been able to follow up on their progress and mm -hmm. how they have changed their attitudes They're in the meantime in college. And it has opened up a totally new world to all these young people, and it really has built friendships across mm -hmm the country. So they're all, especially nowadays, with the possibilities. They're constantly emailing each other, they are rechatting, they have all these different ways to communicate between China and America. And it's a wonderful, extremely important way to build these cultural bridges. So I'm very happy you mentioned the importance yeah. of that. Yeah, I, I really do believe it should be mandatory in colleges. Um, I would agree with that as well. Again, the question of financing, we have to see how to finance yeah. it, but I agree. I think it's so important just to have the chance to actually see yourself through the eyes of someone else, uh, yes. and as well, of course, to get to know the other culture. But I think it's a very helpful uh, experience for everyone. Is there a final question or comment? Yes. Okay. And if you well, could please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Monica Jordan. I'm um, from New York, but I'm currently studying in Taiwan, but I'm just hmm. spending my summer break here. And I do agree that um, uh, these exchange programs are really um, important because it also br um, bridges the understanding of one's, uh, of other cultures. Um, uh, in Taiwan, personally, uh, my, my experience was in Taiwan. It was my first time to be there. Um, I had, I, I only knew f uh, a few facts of it, but when I was there, it was um, pretty much uh, 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 overwhelmed by people who are friendly at the same time, um, they have these um, stereotypes. Yes, yeah. and, and, and it's, uh, it's a struggle. But um, it's also a way of, um, and yes, um, it be cultural um, diplomacy begins at home, but also there's a need to f uh, for work um, be uh, between home with the parents and also with the teachers um, in educating um, these students. And um, it could start out um, in a very young age, but also even in colleges, um, a lot of these um, uh, students are not that much aware um, with, uh, uh, with America, with, um, with the culture here, that it's very, it's very diverse and they want to understand. So it's, it's also a nice way that my university has this um, exchange, um, it's called the chat corner, where, huh. pe where Taiwanese students just come um, and, and engage in, in talking to um, the international students. Mm -hmm. So it's not just Americans, it's also people from uh, Honduras, um, from Nigeria. It's really um, uh, also a way of cultural um, bridging um, sure. diplomacy. So I do agree that it has to be education and be at home. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's an excellent, you made a number of excellent points. Uh, just, just very briefly, the, um, the, the stereotyping that goes on, uh, and I'm sure we're all uh, familiar with that. Um, if we could ban those doggone reality TV shows, <laughs> uh, people would have a very different sense of us, but I guess that's being dictatorial, and that's not uh, very democratic. Um, I, has anybody ever watched Hardcore Pawn? I'm actually hooked on the program, uh, but it shows the worst of human nature um, that is possible. It's a pawn shop in, um, in Detroit, Michigan, not to mention the, the housewives of whatever city that is. I, um, that's the, the worst level of human activity that, um, that I can imagine, and it gets projected around the world. 
and it doesn't it doesn't make it um, any easier for me the fact that other countries are getting their own reality shows similar to that. I think it's uh, we should just ban them. We're we're good people, and we should just ban all of reality TV shows. No, it's a tempting idea, although I think there the job of cultural diplomacy probably isn't to ban, but maybe to try to see how can we create a more fuller picture. Because uh, whether we like it or not, there's, there's stereotypes everywhere. Everyone discriminates. Uh, everyone has misinformation. Everyone has lack of information. So I think that's the job of cultural diplomacy. True. First to assess and say, okay, how is the USA perceived in Afghanistan? Uh, what kinds of experiences has Afghanistan had with the USA? Uh, and what is the, the reality today? And how maybe cultural diplomacy in an honest, transparent way can complete the picture. Uh, yeah. Very important is to discuss also challenges. Uh, in the past, cultural diplomacy tended to focus, I think, too much on positives. Uh, let's talk about nice things, jazz, yeah. art, design, etc. Uh, we also need to talk about human rights. We also need to talk about mistakes. Uh, we also need to talk about actually negative things that have happened. And I think that reconciliation is crucial. Uh, Germany, someone was talking about before, I think Germany has done a very effective job uh, at really dealing in a very proactive way with its past, uh, which has really helped it. Uh, Japan and Italy, for example, have not. Uh, they kind yeah. of moved on. Uh, so I think it's very important, whatever the country is, USA, Afghanistan, of course, is a classic example, or of course, USA is not at all acknowledged really the, the, the terrible uh, tragedies that have taken place. But I think by dealing also with those aspects, it actually makes it easier to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very important point, uh, although it is tempting sometimes, which is ban uh, this program or that program, or to do the opposite. Just I thought if, if I was a dictator in the USA, I would require you know every American to get experience with other cultures, require them to go abroad, etc., which would also be great. Uh, but again, I guess we don't want to support uh, the idea of dictatorships. But no, thank you very, very much for a very thought-provoking discussion. Really appreciate you taking the time and the effort to come, and also the chance and the honor to, to meet you. So if you could please express our sincere gratitude to Ms. Yvonne Captain. Thank you. Thank you.